U.S. presidential showdown, Colombia gives peace a chance, and Russia is blamed for the downing of flight MH17. We'll examine the fallout from the biggest stories of the past seven days. This is Insight Review. Hello and welcome to Insight Review, our look back at the stories that have dominated the headlines for the past seven days. This week, the insults flew when Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton squared off in their first presidential debate. Israel said goodbye to one of its founders, and Colombia's guerrillas signed a deal for peace. We'll examine those with our guest, David Hurst from the news website Middle East Eye, and the broadcaster Lisa Aziz. But first, here's what you need to know about what happened this week. Seven days in 60 seconds. 84 million Americans tuned in to watch Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton go head to head in the first of three live debates. It broke the record of 80 million viewers set in the 1980s when Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan faced off. A report on the downing of the Malaysian Airlines flight MH17 over Ukraine found that the plane was brought down by a rocket fired from Russian-controlled territory. Israel's former president, Shimon Peres, died two weeks after suffering a stroke. The 93-year-old won a Nobel Peace Prize in 1994 for his role in negotiating peace accords with the Palestinians. After 52 years of war, peace was agreed in Colombia this week, with the country's president and the FARC guerrilla group signing a deal to end the half-century of violence. And Pakistan said two of its soldiers had died in exchanges in the disputed Kashmir region. India claimed it conducted surgical strikes on suspected militants. More on some of those stories coming later in the programme. But first, let's concentrate on America. And the first debate of the US elections saw Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump clash over policing, racism and tax. Both claimed victory, but the majority of polls suggested that Clinton outclassed Trump. Let's take a look at some of the highlights. She doesn't have the look. She doesn't have the stamina. I said she doesn't have the stamina. And I don't believe she does have the stamina. To be president of this country, you need tremendous stamina. This is a man who has called women pigs, slobs, and dogs. So he has a long record of engaging in racist behavior. <laughs> Just go to her website. She tells you how to fight ISIS on her website. I don't think General Douglas MacArthur would like that right, too the much. Next, the, next, the next segment, we're continuing well, the subject of... Well, at least I have a plan to fight ISIS. No, no, you're telling the enemy everything you want to do. No, we're not. See, you're no, telling the not. enemy everything we you are, want to do. Well, no wonder fighting. you've been fighting... No wonder you've been fighting ISIS Folks. your entire adult life. I will release my tax returns against my lawyer's wishes when she releases her 33,000 emails that have been deleted. Why won't he release his tax returns? And I think there may be a couple of reasons. First, maybe he's not as rich as he says he is. Second, maybe he's not as charitable as he claims to be. Or maybe he doesn't want the American people, all of you watching tonight, to know that he's paid nothing in federal taxes. So let's get an analysis from our guests, the broadcaster Lisa Aziz and David Hurst from Middle East Eye. David, who won the debate for you? Well, uh, I would like to say Hillary did. Um, and that's conventional wisdom. But you've got to uh, remember that this isn't a conventional... Uh, uh, Far from uh, conventional elections. An, an, an election. And, what, and, and the segment of the population that Trump is speaking to is the, the population of people who say that that segment that says Hillary is an old class of politician, she doesn't get it, uh, this is a, we're, we're, we're into a completely new era now, she's a machine politician, we want someone completely different, we want to speak from the heart. Mm. Um, on the other side, of course, uh, Trump showed all the lack of temperament that Hillary was, was, was particularly with women. Um, and uh, she's scoring a lot of points in very specific segments of, of, of the voting population, particularly women. Then there was Latinas. He started debating Hillary Clinton. He ended up debating um, Miss Universe. 
Yes. The, you know, the comments. Alicia, Alicia, Alicia Mercado. Alicia Mercado. She was so rude about and called her fat and stuff. I mean, that's right. Least, so that's, just, is that a good strategy for any politician? No, not at all. I just thought, I, I really love the debate, I have to say. I thought it was very long, but I thought this was a real chance for Hillary, certainly, to rebut her uh, critics and for Trump to perhaps show that he was a bit more than this brash, volatile. Um, uh, that was an opportunity. <laughs> Do you think he actually proved it? No, or he didn't he, at he did all. the opposite. Um, uh, he just kept digging the hole, didn't he, over the the Miss Universe issue, and uh, uh, and uh, which led us on to immigration. For me personally, the highlight was the tax issue. Why won't he release those tax returns? Now I think Hillary was onto an absolute winner when she said, you know, maybe it's uh, he's he's he's. He'll be proved to show that he's not as wealthy as he is, that he perhaps doesn't give as much charity as he says that he does. Um, you know, why won't he do it? And, and to temper the argument with, well, I'll do it when she releases 33,000 emails was just ridiculous. I think he lost a really big um, chance to have a, go, a proper go at her by staying silent on that. He just let her keep going about the, t the, the tax issue and he didn't really come back and rebut, did he? His no. debate technique... Um, she was very skillful, I think even the most, yeah. most fair-minded analysts would say. He was less so, but that's his shtick, isn't it? Not to be particularly well rehearsed, not to be groomed, not to be a classic politician, David, do you think? Absolutely. I think what he does is he, 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 he works live audiences. Yeah. And he can do that brilliantly. And he can really, he's a real populist. But he's, it wasn't really about the room or but the theatre. But was it, it wasn't about the room, it wasn't about theatre. This was about preparation. Mm. Uh, and he was wrong footed by Hillary on, on more than one occasion. She was properly prepared, definitely. And I thought it was also interesting, right at the end of the debate, Trump seemed to just disappear with his family. Did you see that right at the end, where, uh, whereas um, Bill came on stage and Chelsea came on stage and they were really working, whoever yeah. it was on the front row, they seemed to know them well, all. Well, he did a more unconventional thing by going straight to the spin room. You know, he didn't leave it yes, to all exactly. his, he went his, off. No, no, his he apparatchiks went off. to do the spinning. He went yeah. in there and did the spinning himself. Yeah. And that, I, let me ask you both about this. I mean, it's extraordinary. When you read the reviews, it's as if America is in some suspended animation mm. because there seemed to be an absolute lack of fair analysis. You know, that was a good mark, that was thing, um, going on. And it seemed to be those journalists who support one candidate or the other just were blind to any kind of um, lack of performance in the opponent and just bang on about how wonderful their person is. That's an extremely interesting point because this is a very, very polarised election. And what, I mean, there, there, there are two ways of seeing it. One is that he's losing large parts of the electorate, which I think is happening. But the other way of seeing it is that does it actually matter? Because if it is so polarised, mm. um, you're not going to get a vast number of independents in between. You're going to get people who, who've already made up their minds. So there's a completely different way of seeing this. And Trump is saying, I'm being, I'm being myself. Because that's what it's all about in terms of this last few weeks, isn't it, about winning those independents. The latest polling, as we record this programme, it's still um, Hillary in advance in the states she needs to be ahead to win that electoral college, Lisa. So what's your hunch? What's your feeling? What has to happen for her to, f to lose this? Well... To win it, I'd rather say that um, they were waiting for Michelle Obama to come out and I think play her, play her hand as regards the Bertha issue, which mm. I thought was deeply, deeply embarrassing throughout that debate, particularly for, um, particularly for Trump. I thought it was absolutely dreadful. And um, I think Michelle has come out over just uh, the past couple of days since the debate. Yeah, and, she's done, and she's done a nice big speech. And I think they were waiting for her to sort of play her hand. And I think she, she played a blinder this week, mm. backing Hillary, obviously. But in particular, talking about how deeply hurtful the Bertha issue was for her husband and also um, how Hillary's really doing it for the women, the female vote. But given and I the think she surged in that in yes, recent days. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Well, she's always been ahead, I think, on, yeah. that, on that score and I probably that's still the case. But everyone wonders, there's two more of these things to come. Do you think they will achieve anything? Because there's almost nobody left to persuade one way or another, is there? Well, I think uh, Trump will be better prepared the next time. He was toying with the idea right, to, right towards the end of, of, of some sort of great bash on, on Bill and, and marital in, 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 infidelity and they said, no, 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 no I, I, I can't mention that. He, he, he may throw that in the cards, although that is, is a two-edged sword uh, because, because Hillary acted extremely well as a woman yeah. uh, with and great dignity. And it would make dignity. him look cheap. Yeah. And it would make but him look really cheap. Care about that, but he doesn't yeah. look, yeah. But, but, but he doesn't care about that. So he's, 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 I just think this thing is going to, in, in terms of tone, go downhill all the way because that's the that's the way he Somewhat plays gloomy it. prospect, but no, it'll be, it will be fascinating nevertheless. Thank you guys for the moment.
Now, to Israel. He was one of Israel's most important political figures. Former Prime Minister and the President Shimon Peres died this week. He was 93. He'd had a stroke. World dignitaries, including the former President Bill Clinton, Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas, and the present US President Barack Obama attended the state funeral in Jerusalem. The US President said Mr. Peres had always strived for a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that was fair for both sides. Even in the face of terrorist attacks, even after repeated disappointments at the negotiation table, he insisted that as human beings, Palestinians must be seen as equal in dignity to Jews and must therefore be equal in self-determination. Well, Lisa Aziz and David Hurst are with me this week. Um, David, it's interesting for Shimon Peres. He, he died frustrated, perhaps, that his efforts to peace, which were considerable, didn't realize the ultimate goal. Yes, indeed. Um, he's a very, very uh, interesting historic figure. Um, although a controversial one. Um, but while he was around, um, the peace discourse, if you like, the idea of a peace process uh, carried on. Or uh, with his death, uh, that has virtually disappeared. He's the last symbol of that discourse. Virtually no mainstream uh, politician, Israeli politician, now puts the peace with the Palestinians at the center of its political discourse. There is merits. Uh, and there is Sipi Livni, but they are marginal, unfortunately, uh, in, in the Israeli political discourse. And the Americans, Lisa, they seem exhausted, don't they? I mean, they tried, the Norwegians did so well, we had the Oslo Peace Accord, you think back to the Camp David Peace Accords and things like this. Um, but I suppose with President Obama coming to the end of his two terms, mm. there's no real energy there to try and solve this most intractable problem, is there? No, and I thought it was interesting just watching the coverage of the actual funeral. Uh, the great and the good, obviously, from all around the world, everybody hanging on Obama's words, but exactly as you say, you know, what has really been achieved during that time? And I was just reading, actually, you, you forget that he's the, per he's the only person to have held five of the most senior posts in the Israeli government, uh, defense, finance, foreign minister, president, uh, prime minister, 47 he years. He did every in the job government. going, didn't he? He did every job going. But where, where is Israel and the Palestinian question now? Has it really moved on? No, well, not really. partly it's in his history as well, David, because you mustn't forget he was a tough guy in terms of oh. as defense minister and throughout his political career. He supported Israel being militarily independent and, and having the nuclear deterrent. Yes, I mean, one of the interesting things, sort of, sort of from my point of view, is the huge gap in perception between the Israeli discourse about uh, Perez and the Palestinian one. The Palestinians are not uh, great admirers of Perez for very, very concrete reasons. He uh, was one of the architects of the Suez Crisis. Um, he was also one of the architects of the Israeli nuclear program. Um, after Rabin's death, uh, uh, he, he chose to invade um, uh, Lebanon, and there was a particularly brutal attack on a, uh, on a UN compound uh, in Kana, uh, which led to a massacre. These are the sort of things that Palestinians remember Perez for, in, including the first targeted assassination. So Shimon Perez, the great peacemaker, you think is unfair. It's an incomplete um, epitaph for him. It is incomplete. Um, however, he did actually represent, uh, well, what he represented was a peace process. The Palestinians would say it was, nothing ever happened, and that process was convenient to, to Israel. But even the absence of a process now had, makes itself felt. And I suppose, Lisa, that's, it's common across the Middle East, isn't it, really? Because the Israeli-Palestinian tensions, which still go on, mm -hmm. and Palestinians still complain about their pretty um, basic living standards, the world, if anything, is more concerned with Syria and the relationships that are going on there. Absolutely, and, and you know, um, this a question was posed in one article, did he merely pander to the idea of change to appease his critics? You know, his successors now, after all that time, they're just facing exactly the same challenges. And as you say, the focus is, is it's sort elsewhere. of sl slightly shifted up the road. Okay, okay. we'll talk about more world events a uh, little bit later on. This is Insight Review, and coming up, 52 years of war over the road ahead for Colombia.